We actually are going to go ahead and get started because we've got to be on time because we have our uh, uh, important, important guests who are participating remotely already logged in. And I want to explain that in just a moment. And while we're getting them on the screen, though, I want to, as we do so many times when we have our meetings, it's so important to go to the Lord first. And my friend, uh, uh, Sister Dr. Olivia Mayberry, <laughs> Sister Diana Olivia, would you please come and lead us in prayer? I know her yeah. by so many uh, <laughs> names and, and over the years, but I'm going to call her tonight just my sister in Christ, and I'm so grateful to see you. Oh, good to see you. We used to go to church together, you know. We sure did. Um, this is for our Facebook audience. Okay. Hello, everybody. It is a day that the Lord has made, and we're going to keep on rejoicing and being glad in it. So if you'll just stand with we, me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, 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 how good and kind and merciful you have been to each and every one of us. And as we get ready to transact this glorious moment, we want to acknowledge you in all of our ways. And we understand that our paths are being directed by you, Heavenly Father. So we say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all that is evil for we believe and we know that thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And we say in Jesus Christ's name, be thou glorified in this session as well. And the people of God said, amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you, you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to uh, have a quick introduction because those who are on the screen are way more important than me tonight in telling the story that we are all here uh, to enjoy uh, that story being told. Uh, before we start, though, I do want to just say a few words of introduction. Uh, I want to, first of all, thank NAPAC for allowing us to be here tonight. And I see Bobby Dennis, the executive director, and I also see... Uh, several of the founders, um, well, I see uh, at least two, Ms. Pat, Ms. Mary, uh, did I see Ms. Uh, Terrell a minute ago or Ms. Jones? No, um, I see Mr. Jones here. <laughs> but please give a hand to our founders and our director because we are so grateful. And I also want to thank Nefa Hardy and our team who have been working behind the scenes. Uh, also, Michael Wilson and uh, Lee uh, Hash. And also, uh, we have Adele Blankenstein, Blankenstein, who's probably listening remotely. They've worked so hard behind the scenes for us to make this happen. Um, we have some displays here. Um, and I'm going to actually use these displays in introducing our VIP participants. And I'm going to start with Senator Robert Johnson. And uh, Senator Johnson, you can't see this, but we actually have an updated new photograph of you that is being presented to NAPAC tonight. I call him Senator Johnson because he was Senator first, and once a senator, always a senator. <laughs> senator Johnson, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Well, S Senator Johnson, we have here first African-American state senator from Adams County since Reconstruction, Representative Robert Johnson III, state senator from 1993 
to 2003, State Representative 2003 to present, presented February 22nd, 2024, and this is something that we are presenting to NAPAC this evening in your honor. It's time for me to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and in a moment, we'll let you explain why you have to be here via Zoom. He has a really good reason, and we are so proud of him and how he is representing us in Jackson. But next, I've got to go to this next one. We have here a picture of my friend Daryl Grinnell the 43rd mayor of Natchez. And it says here, Honorable Darrell V. Grinnell, Adams County Supervisor, 1998 to 2016, 43rd mayor of Natchez, 2016 to 2020, presented February 22nd, 2024. Mayor Grinnell, for all your years of service, we felt that your picture should be on the wall here at NAPAC. And we just want to say thank you for your service to Adams County and to the city of Natchez. Thank you for having me this evening. And uh, congratulations to you, Mayor. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We're having a little reverb there. <laughs> Mayor Grinnell, thank you so much. And we're about to turn it over to y'all, but before we do, I have one last introduction to make. We also have information here that tells about, well, Mayor Grinnell will like this. We actually have one that tells about Mayor Grinnell's achievement in making the Proud to Take a Stand monument possible for the city of Natchez in 2019. And we have with us the chairman of that effort, Robert Purnell in the back. So grateful, Mr. Purnell. And Mayor Grinnell, I just wanted you to know that we do now have something chronicling that story here for NAPAC to display. But we also have here another item to be displayed, the story of the secret Black Dot Club. And it has pictures of Longtime Representative John Lewis and a picture of Jonathan Grinnell. And it tells a very powerful story that we're going to hear more about tonight. And Luana Grinnell Ware could not be here in person, but she's here via Zoom. And so, Ms. Ware? Yes. Our friend Luana. And she is going to sing a little bit remotely tonight, but she is actually representing. Natchez Adams County at a uh, conference on education as a member of our uh, school board. Uh, but she is also here along with her brother, Daryl, uh, to represent their father, now deceased, and their family. And so we are very grateful. Uh, I'm just going to have to call you Luana. Thank you for joining us. And I have one other thing I've been told I have to say before I turn it over to them. I'm just going to moderate a little bit this evening. They're going to tell the story. But we decided it would be nice to inaugurate a new event to happen during Black History Month. And we're really grateful to NAPAC for working with us on this, Mr. Bobby Dennis. And this is going to be uh, the first of a series over the next several years uh, where we call attention to some stories that are not told about. And tonight we're going to focus on the politics of Natchez and a story having to do with our political history that many people do not know about and in fact a story I'm just now learning about myself. And that is the story of how we had a group of Natchezians who fought for civil rights here and did such in such a way that through this secret black dot club, they actually helped save the life of a U.S. congressman who became so important to our nation's history. They're going to tell that story. 
Um, there are so many politicians we talk about in the history of our city. We talk a lot lately about Hiram Revels, the first man of color to ever serve in either House of Congress as the first senator to serve, the first black senator to serve, taking his seat in 1870 from Mississippi. We have talked about, over the years, John Roy Lynch, and we need to talk more about him, a former slave uh, from Dunleith, actually, at one time he's, he was there, who became the first African-American speaker of the House Representatives in Mississippi at the age of 26. People don't know that. Such a young man to do so much, and he was actually the first African-American in history of any state to serve as a Speaker of the House. Um, Rep Representative Johnson, Senator Johnson, you may have to correct me on those dates, but I think he was in his 20s when he uh, came to power in Jackson, later to become a United States Congressman, served our country as a military hero, even a major in the Army. He is buried at the age of 92, 1939, John Roy Lynch passed away, and he's, he was buried with honors in Arlington National Cemetery. We have this lineage. We go back to Philip West, who became the uh, first African-American mayor of Natchez since Reconstruction. Recently honored here with a beautiful bus just a week ago. And also someone who was a trailblazer for others to follow in his steps in politics here in Natchez, Adams County. Uh, but tonight we want to focus on this story of the Black Dot Club and also on uh, Mr. Jonathan Grinnell. And we also want to talk about Mr. Rayford Batiste. I tried my best to call him today, but he is 97 um, and I wish he was here in person but he is the only surviving member of that club. And then we also want to talk more about this amazing family connection where these double first cousins, Robert Johnson and Daryl Grinnell, over so many years have served our community. So with that said, I have introduced our panelists. Um, I have explained the reason for our being here. Um, Aldwoman Valencia Hall, thank you for being here with me on behalf of the city. I'm now going to turn this over and serve as a moderator, but I'm going to turn it over to our panelists, and I'm going to start with Senator Johnson because he does have some other commitments this evening, and I'll have him uh, explain that, not me. Uh, Senator Johnson. Thank you, uh, and thank you all for having me, and, and thank you for this honor. And it's so great here to be here with my family and uh, the former mayor, Daryl Grinnell, first cousin and school board member, Luana Grinnell. Uh, it's, uh, it's a testament to a family who has been committed to serving Natchez and Adams County com community and doing the best we can to try to uplift our, not just our family, but everybody around us and, and, and make this community everything that it should be. So we'll, we'll continue that fight. Uh, and and I'm sorry I couldn't be there tonight. We're in session. I just finished a, a uh, public health meeting uh, and state affairs meeting where we were dealing with one of our biggest issues this year is gonna be the expansion of Medicaid and the enhancement of our public health services. And so we, we worked on that till about five o'clock today. And I'm also going to be working tonight because I have to give the response to the state of the state that our governor will be giving on Monday. And so I, I have to do some work on that tonight. They're taping it tomorrow. So I have to have all that prepared. And uh, just to continue to highlight how important it is to do all we can for Southwest Mississippi and everybody who lives west of I-55. There hadn't been any uh, major economic development uh, in that area in the last 30 years, and it's incumbent upon us and it's incumbent upon everybody here in the Jackson to make sure that the governor, uh, all the leadership in the state understand what our needs are and how important and how valuable this part of the state is. 
So it's an honor to continue to serve and it's an honor to be here tonight. And I wish I could be there with you in person, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna continue to work for you and serve you. And, and thank you so much for this honor. Thank you. Senator Johnson, while you are here with us, I'd like for us to go ahead and start with all three of you on the screen, a uh, discussion of the uh, Black Dot Club and that part of history. And just conversationally, let's get into a discussion of what that was for Natchez and uh, the role of your family members in that uh, important time. And I'll ask uh, Mayor Grinnell to go first, uh, but understanding your time, uh, we'll get right to you as soon as we can, and then when you have to leave, Mayor Grinnell and Ms. Ware can continue the conversation. So you want me to start, yes. uh, Mayor? Am yes, I understanding Mayor. you correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. And again, uh, thank you, Mayor, and to all the citizens of Natchez uh, for the great work that you're doing. And uh, congratulations to Zion Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church on donating the property for uh, the Triangle property uh, for Rebels Park, which I am truly excited about because it was during my administration uh, that we adopted the downtown plan and the Part of that plan was uh, to get the Rebels Park started. And of course, uh, during my tenure, tenure of four years as mayor of the city, uh, we didn't have enough time because we went through the process of getting the plan adopted. So Mayor Gibson, you've started implementing that plan and I really wanna thank you for that. Um, as far as the Black Dot Club. Uh, uh, hello? I'm sorry. Uh, when I uh, was a little boy, along with me and my siblings, uh, we can remember as kids uh, seeing our dad. And, and one day, my dad had his shirt off. And we noticed that there was a black dot on his chest. So we immediately inquired about that black dot. And that's when my dad and my mom told all of us, you know, the history of the Black Dot Club. Uh, it was basically like a, a secret civil rights um, organization um, whose job was it uh, was to protect uh, civil rights activists uh, that would actually come into Natchez, um, not just the civil rights activists, but also individuals who would come in and help uh, to get Black Americans uh, registered to vote. And so we always heard the story um, of the Black Dot, and periodically we would strategically, you know, ask our dad and mom to tell us that story over and over and over again. And one of the uh, things about the Black Dot Club is that um, <clears throat> Congressman John Lewis uh, came into Natchez uh, to help to get Black Americans registered to vote and to also speak at some of the uh, community meetings. Well, uh, the word was, was that the Klan was going to um, actually uh, attempt to uh, assassinate uh, Congressman Lewis uh, in Natchez. Uh, so members of the Black Dot Club immediately uh, had to create a strategy to get him out of Natchez. Um, and, you know, my dad um, was a race car driver and he, he knew the back roads of Natchez and he and several other members of the Black Dot Club were able to get uh, Congressman Lewis uh, loaded in a car and to get him out of Natchez safely. And uh, years later, when I became grown and elected official, um, I, I met uh, Congressman uh, Lewis and, 
you know, I, I told him who I was and, and told him about that facet of history in Natchez. And he remembered that. And uh, he told me to tell my dad and other members of the Black Dot Club, thank you uh, for getting me out of Natchez uh, to prevent, you know, an, assassin, uh, an assassination on my life. You know, the Black Dot Club uh, was so secretive that not even myself or my siblings knew all of the members. Um, it was by uh, coincidence one day that uh, I was somewhere in a store and uh, Mr. Baptiste, uh, Rafer Baptiste, uh, came up to me and he said, uh, Daryl, tell your dad I'll be coming by to pick up a donation because Mr. R.T. King, I'm sorry, not Mr. R.T. King, but uh, Mr. Leroy Hunt had passed away. And he said, Leroy Hunt was one of our members of the Black Dot Club. So I need to take up a donation from all the members of the Black Dot Club uh, so that we can take to the family of Mr. Leroy Hunt. And that's how I discovered that uh, the late Leroy Hunt, uh, the late R.T. King, um, and of course, Rafer Baptiste, and there are other members, and I'm sure there are other members who are still alive today, um, but it was such a secretive organization that, you know, we didn't know who all the members were, uh, were and who are today. Uh, so uh, it was a, an, an important facet of the civil rights movement in Natchez. I mean, you had all of these great organizations. You had NAACP. Uh, you had, of course, the Deacons of Defense. Uh, you had the Black Dot Club. And all of them, their purpose was to actually help uh, in the civil rights movement, to tear down the, wall, the walls of segregation, uh, to you know, help to uh, get people registered to vote. And, and as a result of their efforts, um, today, we have black elected officials, uh, not only in the city of Natchez, but in Adams County and throughout the state of Mississippi, as a result of the work that those people did on our behalf. They were not just working for their generation. What they were doing, that they were working for generations of the future. And, um, if you go back and look at those that went to Parchman in 1965, the Proud to Take a Stand group, the Parchman ordeal, those individuals, they march in the city streets of Natchez, not just for their generation, but for future generations. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, Mayor, thank you. Very moving to hear that account. We're going to come back to you and also to Ms. Ware in a moment. Um, but while we have Senator Johnson, if you would, uh, Senator, tell us some of your recollection of that time in our history. Uh, thank you, May. Uh, I don't have... Uh, any stories about clubs or any of that. It's more organic in the sense that uh, I'll start where uh, my cousin finished talking about people going to Parchment. Our uncle, James Johnson, was one of the people who, as a student, who was part of the protest who, would take, who was taken to uh, Parchment. And there, there was actually a New York Times story written about him. He was a, he was a diminutive uh, individual. He wasn't that big, but he had a lot of heart and a lot of fire. And there was a story about one of the prison guards picking on him, picking him up by the by the by the by his beard and holding him up in an effort to intimidate and torture him. But it, but it didn't do any do any good because he he stayed the course and with everybody else up there and and endured that that turmoil. But we came up in a family where everybody stood up and and believed in service. My mother and father supported individuals financially uh, and and politically. Uh, throughout my, my lifetime. I grew up watching people like uh, Supervisor and Representative Barney Scobie, Supervisor and Representative Philip West, who were who were leaders and members of the NAACP and friends of my father. And they all were involved in that organization and they all pooled resources and efforts and energy to make sure that people and the things that we stood for 
were highlighted and that and that they never backed down. At 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 10 years old, my mother and father had me uh carrying a picket sign right outside of McCrory's over in the Woolworth shop shopping center because they wouldn't hire black cashiers. They could only work in in menial jobs and they they worked for those kind of efforts and we we marched and we watched what what happened and we we also grew up in an era where we witnessed the aftermath of the Wallace Jackson assassination who was a cousin of ours that the children are and and we we understood how important that kind of sacrifice was and that that kind of thing had a very important impact on me and I as student body president at North Natchez High School and later as, as vice chair of the National Black Law Students Association, all those all those efforts were things that that inspired me to to a uh, to a a career of service. I wanted to be a lawyer because I thought that was the best way for you to to you to fight inequities and, and in injustice. Uh, I didn't do as much as I as a lawyer as, I, as I'd like to do. A lot of it had already been done. But it, it inspired me to, to use that skill in my uh, position as a legislator. But the, the biggest inspiration uh, that any of us have are our parents who who sacrificed and helped people who needed help and, and did things that that other people couldn't do, but they could do it in their stead. And they always taught us that, you know, you should always help your neighbor and you should never uh, think of yourself any better than anybody else. That's what we, we, we fight for equality. And that means that, that starts with you. And that's what our parents taught us. Uh, we grew up in a, in a family of people who, who believed in treating people the right way. And that translated into our political careers and into our advocate careers and to our ability to make things happen for people. And so we didn't come by this by accident or by vanity. We came by it in a spirit of service. And so that's why we're here. We're here to represent uh, Henrietta and Cleve Johnson and 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 Tom Grinnell and Ms. Annie Mae Grinnell and Nanny Johnson and all the people who came before us who, who worked hard to make sure that we had an opportunity to do to continue the work that they started. And so I'm I'm proud to be here and I'm proud to be here with members of my family and uh I want to continue it. Uh people ask me now at 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 65 years old, why do you still have the energy and the passion because there's still work to be done and I'll do this work until until I feel like I, there's no more I can do. And so uh, as I get prepared to answer uh the governor on Monday uh, I, I'll think about all the things that we learned and were inspired by in Natchez, and it'll always be with me. And again, I thank you all for this honor, and I hate that I have to leave, uh, but as good as I am at, at speaking, I got to sit down and write this one because they want me to they want me to have it on, on transcript where they can read it on a teleprompter. So uh, I got to get it right. So I, I, I appreciate you all having me tonight, and uh, please accept my apologies for having to leave early. One comment before you leave us. Um, I, I don't know that everyone appreciates something that happened uh, just last week, but for the first time, our state capitol has, a, has a, a beautiful portrait of a beautiful lady, Representative Alice Clark, who served our state for so many years and was a pioneer, uh, truly, uh, as uh, the first African-American female member of the state legislature. Um, and to my knowledge now, that is the only, the first and only uh, such portrait of a trailblazer now hanging in the state capitol. Is that correct? First portrait of a non-governor would be hanging in. Um, but I'm speaking, I'm speak, uh, and of a non-governor, um, and so it yeah. says a lot. But what I'm, I want to say is this: we're very grateful to former state representative Andrew Catchings, who now is the clerk of the house, and we've uh, been so grateful to have some meetings with him just recently, um, because he also saw to it that the statue that used to be so prominently displayed there, and it made headlines when he uh, politely ushered. Uh, uh, Governor Bilbo to a closet and then finally to archives and history where he should rightfully be displayed. 
a Natchezian uh, standing up for progress. And, and, I, and we want to thank in that progress another Natchezian, you, uh, Senator Johnson, helping lead the effort for a new state flag. Uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing progress, but I would really love to see some pioneers from Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, John Roy Lynch and also Hiram Revels honored at our state capitol one day. Um, that, that is possible, and I just want to throw that out there. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate everything you all have agreed. Thank you. Now, we will be looking for you on Monday evening as you give us uh, your statement from the state of the state address. It will be on Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we now have a brother-sister team here, and uh, and we've been waiting to hear from you, Ms. Ware. Um, we're so grateful that you took time out to join us tonight, and so we're now going to go uh, to you, and I'd like for this to be a time now for you um, and your brother to just have a back-and-forth conversation about the history that you grew up around and your recollections. Well, um, as Daryl will tell you, with us being uh, eighth generation Natchezians, and you know it's just a blessing that we're looking at everything uh, coming to fruition and, and, it's not, and it's not stopping. You know, we are members of Zion Chapel AME Church and my great grandparents were members of Zion Chapel AME Church and St. Paul AME Church. Former, you know, they were former slaves. And who would have thought that my dad, our family, uh, the Johnsons and the Grinnells, they they walked through uh civil rights, you know, and they never they never stopped telling us all of our growing up uh years, they always told us about the civil rights movements. And who would have thought that my dad went all through that? for Daryl to eventually become mayor, but he was supervisor, he was county supervisor for 18 years. I mean, who can say that evidently Natchez saw something in my brother, for my brother to continuously represent our district, our ward, our district, and then become mayor. You know, my dad, if he was here right now, he would have a story to tell because he loved to tell stories. And no matter how many times he told that story, it was the same. So I know it was the truth. And Daryl, he can go back, uh, as he said, when John Lewis saw him, you, he spoke at our commencement um, one year. And I was, I was uh, at the luncheon and John Lewis walked up to me and he asked me, he said, are you a Grinnell? Are you from Natchez? And I said, yeah. And he went on to tell me the story. So then when I went home, I was so excited. Oh, I'm getting ready to, and Daryl was like, yeah, he told me the same story when I was in D.C. So, you know, it's, it's just like, that. that's history for us that our family fought. And now I am director of educational equity and inclusion. I'm dean of students. I'm assistant vice president for student affairs. My, my father would have no idea. He would be smiling right now. He would be driving to Alcorn just to sit in my office. You know, he, he loved his kids, and he loved everything that we've done. And I believe every last one of us are instrumental, and the six of us, we're instrumental in some form of uh, opportunities, to, opportunities that has happened in Natchez. But in addition to that, uh, my dad, you know, yes, he loved his family, but he also loved his community, Natchez. And um, I remember it was the week that President Obama won as being the first Black American president in the United States. And um, what they did is that they, the Natchez Democrat interviewed uh, local Natchezians to get a reaction from local Natchezian, Natchezians about uh, the victory of President Obama. And there was one of the individuals in the article who said that she didn't believe that President Obama, you know, paid the price in terms of, you know, doing what civil rights activists do 
in order to, to become president. And so we were all at the house. We were reading the Natchez Democrat. We read this statement. And my dad immediately chimed in and he said, that's why I did what I did during the civil rights movement so that individuals like President Obama can become president one day. So my dad participated and my mom participated in the civil rights movement, not for self, but for others um, beyond the parameters of family, but for others and for future generations. And as a result of the efforts of not just my dad, but other people who you know, stood the grounds for civil rights, who made the sacrifices, who lives were lost as a result of the civil rights movement, they paid the price in order to open the door for future generations of Black Americans. And I'll never forget, you know, uh, they never tell us what they've done for other, uh, other people in our community or whatever. So one day, uh, an 18 wheeler came down Martin Luther King and Woodlawn, and it just pulled all the lines down. It was it, it, it shouldn't have been going down Martin Luther King Street in the first place, but it pulled all the lines down, and it uh, it pulled my 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 dad had a gas station on the corner of Martin Luther King and Woodlawn, so it pulled that overhead down. And my dad, he got his welding truck and he started to try to repair the pole because it was leaning into the street. And so we're out there and we're watching him. And the next thing you know, it was men coming from everywhere. It was like stone soup. They were coming from everywhere with their welding machines and their, and their, um, their tools. And they said, no, Mr. Grinnell, you sit back and let us do this because you helped me do this. You helped me do that. You, they didn't charge them. They went in and it's still standing today. And it was just amazing. I don't even, I think maybe my dad even forgot what he has done for one person where they had run out of gas. He put gas in their car. Don't worry about it. Someone, uh, someone's fence was falling down. He went out and he welded. Don't charge me. I'm good. So, you know, he was the price he paid for a lot of things. Our community paid him back. And when he passed and when we had the memorial, we had it in his backyard because that's what he loved. He loved his house and he loved his yard. And it was so many people that came out for his passing, you know, understood. My, my parents did a whole lot that they never told us. So uh, Senator Johnson, Repres Representative Johnson, because he was a state senator first before he became a state representative. Um, you know, he talked about the, uh, the 1965 uh, Parchment Ordeal. Um, those 467 people who were proud to take a stand uh, for civil rights in the city of Natchez, um, he told, uh, a facet of that story about our uncle, our mother's youngest brother, uh, James Johnson. And um, of course, we grew up knowing that history of the Parchman ordeal from our parents. Uh, my mom was actually pregnant at that time with me uh, in 1965. So she wanted to be in the march, but my dad told her, no, Renza, you stay at home. And he said, I'm going. And he was one of the ones that was, uh, of course, arrested and went up to Parchment Penitentiary. And he would always tell us the story about the bus ride up uh, to Parchment. And uh, his seat partner was the late Reverend Russell, who owned the Texaco service station directly from my grandparents' golf service station. And Reverend Russell, who was one of the leaders of the civil rights movement in Natchez, you know, he had this, this loud voice and he was powerful. And he, you know, he kept the, the black Americans on that bus trip, you know, calm and relaxed. You know, he said, everything's gonna be all right. And, um, you know, he, he would start singing and 
you know, the, the individuals on the bus would start singing with him. And my dad said that as they were entering into the gates of Parchman Penitentiary, he noticed that Reverend Russell had gotten quiet. And my dad looked over to Reverend Russell and he saw tears flowing from Reverend Russell's eyes. And my dad asked Reverend Russell, he said, what's wrong, Rev? And Reverend Russell looked at my dad and he said, I don't think we're gonna be able to come out of this. And my dad said, oh yeah, Rev, we're gonna be okay. We're gonna make it through, we're gonna pull through. So when they were all incarcerated on the maximum security side of Parchman, uh, Reverend Russell was in a jail cell next to my dad. And my dad's cousin, Robert Johnson and Theodore Johnson came up about a week later to get my dad. So when my dad was leaving his cell, Reverend Russell grabbed my dad and he said, baby dump, call my wife and tell her to come and get me because they're gonna kill me up here. And my dad said, as soon as we can get to a payphone, I'm gonna call Mrs. Russell. And my dad said, as they were exiting the entrance of Parchment, there was Mrs. Russell and a driver bringing her in to Parchment to get Reverend Russell. So, of course, he made it all alive. So there are many of those stories uh, that exist out there of those individuals who were incarcerated, not only in Parchman, but in the city jail and county jail. And I think it's important for all of those individuals who are still alive to be able to, to tell those stories, tell those stories. And, and make them a part of the archives of history in that right. jail. Because history is so important. One important facet of history is that it can guide us through our future because history has a tendency to want to repeat itself. And when we know our history, we can become mitigators, we can become proactive, and we can modify in order to prevent those ugly facets of history from repeating right. themselves. And you know, we had even had, even the eighties, we had to, we we fought, Daryl and I, along with our other uh, siblings, we walked a picket line in, in 88, 89, so that we could, um, we could all go to one school. You had a North Natchez and a South Natchez. You know, we were still divided. All the, we were equal, but we were still divided. And look today, we have one beautiful school Natchez High School. And you know, the I don't know when the last time a school was built. Was it in the, it was in the 50s probably. And correct me if I'm wrong, Daryl, because you know your history. But look at today, we have a state of the art. We have a state of the art school today. And it's because of us continuing to fight for equalness. And that was in the 80s. So it's just a blessing that we're here, Daryl's teaching down in New Orleans. Um, I'm employed at Alcorn State University and on the school board in Natchez. So we can continue to fight for our kids, our students. Right. Um, that's the reason I'm not there with you this evening. Uh, I'm in New Orleans um, and I'm actually giving exams uh, to my students this week. Uh, I'm teaching honors chemistry and honors biology at a school called the Willow School. Uh, it's one of the top performing uh, schools here in New Orleans. And um, it was formerly known as Lusher. And a couple of years ago, um, they decided to change the name to the Willow School because Lusher uh, is a name from a segregationist um, that was a part of the New Orleans area. Uh, so uh, it is now known as the Willow School. So I'm in the exams this week. And uh, actually, uh, one of the things that my school does is that it celebrates Black history. So today, um, I actually shared uh, with my students uh, the proud to take a stand of Natchez. And I showed that little segment from WOBT 
uh, and my students were really, really enlightened about that facet of, uh, of, of Black American history. And, you know, I'm, I'm at a, a school board conference and they're trying to uh, they're trying to take out black history in the schools. So, you know, we have to continue to fight for our history. It, well, it may not be black history. It's American history. If you're going to take it out, you need to merge it into our history, period. So, you know, those are the things that we have to fight for. So we, our kids, well, our kids know our black history because we tell them every day, but all kids need to know the good, the bad, and the ugly of history, period. So we wanna thank you, Mayor. We wanna thank the citizens of Natchez um, for just uh, acknowledging our family, but we're not, like Daryl said, we're not the only family that uh, bought the price. In Natchez. Yeah, there are many, many great uh, Black American and White American Natchezians who uh, made the sacrifice. You know, and I, you know, today I, I was thinking about people like Miss Leola Newell, um, mm -hmm. Anne, which was Miss Alberta Ferguson. Yes. You know, I was thinking about uh, all of those individuals um, who uh, went through those, that tumultuous period the Leon right. Howards, the Shea Baldwins, and, and all of those uh, great individuals who made sacrifices. So many uh, that you can't name, but I, you know, Miss Leola Newell is a name that came across my head today. She and Miss yeah. who stood the picket lines out there. And they were in their 80s. Right. You know, I remember uh, Miss Leola Newell, you know, told me one day, she said, Grinnell, one thing that I always wanted, and I said, what is that, Miss Leola? She said, I always wanted a high school diploma. I said, Miss Leola, you have gone beyond high school. You have made so many sacrifices, and you've done so many great things for this community and the future of Black Americans um, that, you know, you have credentials beyond a high school diploma. Well, I'll tell you, uh, my sister mentioned it earlier. Uh, back in the late 80s, uh, I took a leave of absence from um, my alma mater, Tougaloo College, uh, to protest uh, the segregated school system in the city of Natchez. So uh, me and all my sisters and brother, uh, we walked the picket lines. And the leadership of that boycott appointed me to be in charge of all the picketers um, doing that particular boycott. So that actually got me interested in the community in terms of, you know, wanting to uh, be a part of the community in terms of helping to create policies that were going to benefit everybody in the community. So I think that that was the spark that ignited me uh, to want to run for office. So in 1987, no, I'm sorry, 1997, uh, I ran for county supervisor. Uh, and of course, I was elected county supervisor and uh, I served 18 years as county supervisor and I retired uh, in 2015, not only as county supervisor, but also retired as um, a professor at Alcorn State University. Um, and it was upon my retirement that, you know, people 
all over the city approached me about running for mayor. And I prayed on it. And um, I ended up running for mayor. And um, of course, I faced a lot of challenges as mayor because the fiscal house was in the red. Uh, crime was on a rise. Um, we had a lot of infrastructure issues in the city. Uh, there were a lot of things going on. And what I had to do is that I had to roll up my sleeves and I went to work for the citizens of Natchez. Um, as you know, I did not accept a mayor's salary. I did not accept a city vehicle. I did not accept the city's health insurance. Uh, I didn't do it for any perks or benefits. I did it because I loved my citizens and I loved the city. And I did that. The pandemic hit. Uh, I was the first mayor in the state of Mississippi and probably in the country to form a COVID-19 task force to start putting efforts in place to reduce the fatalities uh, of the pandemic. And then, of course, um, I decided uh, that four years, you know, was enough. It was time for me to move on. I did um, what I could do for the city and the citizens of Natchez, and uh, it was time to move on. Uh, and uh, married a great person, uh, Michael Washington Grinnell. And uh, so uh, we still have a house in Natchez. We come up at least one uh, weekend out of a month, sometime twice. Uh, and we're there to see family. We're there when hurricanes hit and we're there for holidays. Mayor, thank you, and, and I, I just appreciate all you've done for Natchez, and I, and I thank you for your vision for our city that has made it possible for me to step in and carry on through with things that you started, and, uh, and we are so excited when we finally get Hiram's Revels, Hiram Revels Park, Hiram Revels Plaza uh, done, uh, you're going to be there. <laughs> yeah. I am, I am truly, you just don't realize when you sent me that email about um, the property being turned over to the city for Revels Park. I was so happy and excited about that because that was one of the first things that I wanted to see from the plan that we adopted uh, for downtown was to enhance the black business area of Natchez. And that's the heart of it right there mm -hmm. at Rebels Park. And I am just so excited. I can't wait to see the statue of Iron Rebels in the green space. It's going to create a domino effect that's yeah. going to be positive for that area and the community. You've got the forks of the road uh, on one end of St. Catherine, and then you're going from bondage to freedom. Revels Park, that trail is going to be phenomenal. Yes, it is. Well, at this point, I'd like to open up for questions, comments uh, pertinent to our discussion. And I'll uh, pass the microphone around. Alderwoman Hall. Mayor, Gr Mayor Grinnell and Board of Trustee, Ms. Ware, and Dean of Students, Ms. Ware, et cetera, at Alcorn State University, Ms. Ware. Thank you, and also Representative Johnson. I refer to him as Representative Johnson. And thank you all for your family's contribution to the civil rights movement in Natchez, for the movement in Natchez for all people. And I am grateful to know, have known all of you since childhood and what a blessing you all are to each one of us in the city of Natchez as well as to your family and to the state of Natchez. So thank you all very much from the bottom of my heart and my families, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alderwoman Hall. Um, and of course, I mean, your family, the history there is astronomical. Uh, the house that you live in, Richard Wright, his childhood home. I mean, 
we have a wealth of Black American, Native American, and other facets of nationalities, history of Natchez. I mean, Natchez is truly, it is an archive of history. It is a museum. Uh, it is so rich. And, it's a walking uh, museum. Yeah. And, and Daryl, uh, when you said Richard Wright, my grandfather drove him around, you know, when they were younger. If well, you want to uh, when my dad, yeah. uh, when our grandfather was uh, working for the Corps of Engineers, uh, he used to pick up Richard Wright at Hobo Fork uh, when he would come down to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, so Richard Wright on many days uh, would ride with William Cleve Johnson, uh, our grandfather. Um, and there are transcripts of my grandfather that actually document uh, those relationships that he had uh, with our own native son, Richard Wright. So there are so many facets of history. And that's why it's so important that the NAPAC Museum, um, that you know, people need to share their archives with NAPAC so that all of the stories can be told. You know, I, um, Michael, my husband, he periodically will tell me, you know, the history of his family, um, his grandmother and uh, her sister and her brother and the relationships that they had and, and how they migrated uh, to that area in, in Adams County. And uh, so, so many families out there, you've got that history and that history needs to be archived. It needs right. to be preserved. And you know, that's why I think uh, these nights like tonight here at NAPAC are so important because we're telling that history. Um, I'd like to see if we have other questions, comments. We're honored to have Ms. Thelma Newsom here who served for many years on the school board and was an essential part of the planning and execution of uh, that new high school. Um, I may be putting you on the spot, but you served on the school board during a very important time in our history, uh, building a new high school for the first time, as they've said, in so many years. Ms. Newsom, could I ask you to share some of that story with us? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. And yes, this is putting me on the spot, but <laughs> um, I did serve on the board when we initially started the plans for building a new high school. It wasn't easy. We had all of the plans, or so we thought, and just as with everything else, when we tried to pass a bond issue, it didn't pass. So we had to go back and regroup. By then, Mr. Butcher had come on board. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Mr. Butcher, but he came to us from Louisiana. He had the experience of having been a principal. He was serving on the board, school board in Louisiana, and he had served on the hospital board. They had just built a new hospital. So bringing all of that with him, he knew in depth about what we were gonna be facing in trying to build a new school. He brought in two groups to talk to us about how much money it would take, what kind of plans we would need, so on and et cetera. We found an architecture that came in and he designed what the school would look like. The first designs we had, we couldn't use them because we didn't have enough money. We had to go back to him and I think it took about three years before we could get back with him and have him to redo those designs. And this time when he came, Mr. Butcher had a plan. He came to us and told us how we could use the interest from our 16th section land and use that money to build the school. You have to pay it back now. It's not something that you use for free. But we had enough in that account where we were able to borrow from ourselves 
and we built that school. So now all they're having to do is to meet that note. It means you probably have to cut a few corners here and there with some other things. But we have a brand new state-of-the-art high school. And as Mrs. Ware said a few minutes ago, this is Natchez, Mississippi. And I would like to invite you on her behalf and all of the other school board members who are currently serving, please go out and see what Natchez has done, what the citizens of Natchez have done. And I think you will be very proud of what we have there. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And when you go to the high school, uh, when you go to the, the dining hall, you'll see where uh, Mrs. Newsom was instrumental in the design of the dining hall. And I have, I have some big shoes I have to fill, Ms. Newsom. And I want to also say, Ms. Newsom, y'all not only built a new high school, but you also renovated the old high school, and we now have a state-of-the-art middle school. Yes. Wow. You know, the old high school, the old high school had a lot of glass. And when we got started, everybody was talking about the safety issues and all of these kinds of things. And again, a plan was developed where we could remove that, some of that glass. And you wouldn't have to worry about anyone being able to just walk by and shoot or whatever they would decide to do into those classrooms. We didn't know what it would look like. So again, we got a, a sample of the design, looked at it, studied it. And after we looked at that and reviewed it, we felt that that was the best way for us to go. And it too is very good. So please go by and look at what we have there. Thank you. Do we have others? We would also like to uh, thank the Sagos for everything that they've done uh, near the triangle where the Rhythm Nightclub uh, is, the museum is located. And they also, they need to know our people in Natchez, the younger ones especially, they need to know that history. We only celebrate it really once a year, but that should be part of the curriculum as well because because of the Rhythm Nightclub fire, there were some changes made with the fire laws. Oh, I've just given the microphone to uh, Mrs. Sego. Uh, and this is the microphone for the Facebook online social Good evening. <laughs> Good evening uh, to everyone and most of all to our special guests who are coming to us by video. Coming uh, to us by uh, video or uh, I've known the uh, Cornell and the Johnson's family for a number of years and as time has gone on, I have learned that uh, by way of others that they are relatives of mine. I don't know anything about it, but, <laughs> but according to uh, others. Uh, I have worked with uh, Daryl and Luana's uh, mother, who uh, both taught in the Natchez public schools for a number of years. Matter of fact, I taught for 25 and a half years. I didn't get a chance to uh, teach any of the children, but his mother, uh, their mother, and I worked together for a number of years, and I did become great friends with uh, Mr. Grinnell, because he would always come over. During Mrs. Grinnell's uh, break, uh, during his break, and I always would uh, chat with her. Uh, maybe he was getting off from work and he came by to see her. And it just so happened that I would always be coming along, uh, taking my children someplace, and I would get a chance to talk to him for a few minutes. But uh, I'm grateful that Mrs. Johnson, I also work with her, who's their uh, aunt, uh, she was principal, teacher, and all we all work together with me, uh, conferences, and um, the like together. But we as 
owners, my husband and I, my girl, as owners of the Rhythm Night Club, and I always tell them, sir, that we did something that we don't know how we did ourselves. We didn't know much about the Rhythm Club uh, at all. Really, we had heard about it, but we didn't know anything special about it until we had gone to that property in 1983, and we started an auto detail. And the elders, when I say the elders, we're talking about people like Reverend Baldwin and uh, Reverend Mazik and uh, Ms. Rosalie Hawkins and all, they were patrons. They were coming in telling Monroe the story about what had happened on that very property. Of course, we were young people, we had children. Uh, we had to uh, make a living. My husband had worked at the Wholesome Bakery the Baker had closed, and this is when we started this business thing. But anyway, as time went on and we met the elders there, they started telling us the story about what had happened on that very property. And people will say that talk is cheap. People were talking about the Rhythm Club, oh, we might need to do something, we need to do this, we need to do that. So finally one night, uh, Mother and me talked about it a lot. Finally I told him, I said, you know, we own this property. If we don't do something with this, nobody else will. And that's how the Rhythm Club got started. We started, when we first started, we were in a 10 by 20 office space. And we started having open air commemorations uh, each year. And this particular year, which was April of 2010, the fourth Saturday in April, we decided that we were going to put out some of this information that had been given to us over a period of 20 years. We had placed some of this materials in the storage room and all, and you know what happened when you put things in the storage room over time, you start getting bugs and everything else in there. So we started from there, we put a display and exhibit uh, there at the Quality Car Care Center. I don't know if many of you remember or not, but we were doing a great job at the uh, car care. But then we had to change, and we started putting this exhibit there. Putting that exhibit there, uh, had people come in and folk were standing outside the door. A group would go in, a group would go out. And that was how we saw how people had taken to the idea of what we had done. This was in April. By August of 2010, we had extended and added on to the Rhythm Club Museum uh, added on to the quality car care, and many people thought we were working on the car care extended in it, but actually, some things you just have to keep to yourself. And that's what we did. We kept it to ourselves, and then we found out, or everybody found out, that we were doing the Rhythm Night Club on site Memorial Museum which officially opened August the 10th, August the 16th, 2010. And that's how we got to the museum. We've had people from all over the world that has come in. And the people within your city, the children don't know much about anything. So we as adults, we've got to bring our children in, and we did, and I, the thing that we do uh, each year is we have a high school student who's about to go off to college, come into that museum, get familiar with the information that we have there, write a narrative, and they will be presented a scholarship on the fourth Saturday of April each year. As of today's date, we have given uh, 14 scholarships. The first two scholarships 
were given to eighth graders who were going on a church trip. They were from the boys' home, Pendleton's boys' home, on Low with the Road. They were trying to sell candy. Their uh, mother brought them to the museum from the home. And they asked me if I wanted to buy some candy because they were trying to sell candy to make themselves uh, eligible to go on this trip. And I asked them and they told me. So I looked at Monroe and I said to him, I said, these children are trying to sell candy and they are from the boys' home. We are going to make sure that they write a narrative and we're going to send them on that trip to Bronson, Missouri. They wrote the, uh, what they knew. They were eighth graders, two boys, one white boy, one black boy. And we gave a $500 scholarship and we split between the two, which was $250. And I did learn that the $250 was enough money for those boys to go on that trip. And from then on, we started working with fourth graders and all. But the key and the most important thing is our children don't know how to, I would say, hustle. That means that they are interested in going to school and all of that, but they don't know the avenues that they need to follow to get what they need. And so this is what we do. We have a high school each year to come in and do what they need to do. We don't just give money away. They must do something to earn it, to get it. And that's what we do every April, uh, fourth Saturday in April. Have this uh, open air commemoration. We have guest speakers. We uh, give away door no prizes. And we also serve refreshments giving people a chance to see each other, meet each other, talk about whatever they want to talk about, and I'll just get a chance to mingle. With these few words, I know it's not a few words, I've said a whole lot of words. <laughs> That's just big. But I try to explain myself and let people know what we do. Now, we do accept donations. We do accept donations. I see one of my uh, people that I go to Lee to get my shirts and my plaques and whatever else that we need. But we are committed to what we do. And I am humbled with what we are doing. I don't feel all puffed up because of we have the rhythm club. I'm still big, and I believe in education. Education is power. And uh, many people don't believe that they feel like they can get through. You gotta know how to, how to do something and how to maneuver in life. With these few words, I do thank you. Ms. Sega, thank you so much. Um, we are about, you mentioned refreshments, and we, we have some. And so we are about to uh, call this uh, to a close, um, and we're going to have some last words in a moment from our um, honorees. But before we do, uh, I'm bad about putting people on the spot, but there's something I love about, about the history of civil rights. And that is that it's about what is right. And it's not a black thing, it's not a white thing, it's just what is right. And I'm so grateful that in our community, we have people among us who are in the Caucasian community who were a part of the fight for civil rights. One of those is right here, Diana Nutter. And she's so humble. And I don't know if she's gonna say anything or not. <laughs> She's shaking her head there. <laughs> and so I'm going to have to say it for her. But she and her father 
and then her husband later, they, many years ago, uh, committed themselves to creating an opportunity for there to be communication in the community. And they started uh, WMS? Uh, uh, MIS. I knew I was going to get it wrong. <laughs> WMIS, and then later purchased and brought back WTYJ. Um, I know Mayor Vanell appreciated the weekly time he had on that radio station when he was mayor. I appreciate the time I do, but I really appreciate uh, Ms. Nutter and her family uh, for making this. Ms. Nutter was my first boss. Well, for over 25 years. Wow. And so it's under my age. Yeah, she's there. Oh. I'm looking at her. She's here. <laughs> Let me okay. tell you, uh, Ms. Nutter is truly, truly a great lady, and she and her husband did so much, so much for our community. Uh, and she allowed me to host a weekly talk show called Straight to the Point. Uh, right. I mean, just an outstanding, outstanding family. And I, I truly love Diana as my second mom because she was there for me and, 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 and my family. You know, uh, at one time she it was three of us working there at one at one time. I did I did six to twelve, Anne did twelve to six, and Renza did uh 6 to 12 midnight, and we had some kind of show. And she never not once, and she could correct me from wrong, but she never had any problems from either one of us. <laughs> Thank you so but she much. Is the reason, she is the reason I am who I am today, because she gave me a voice. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask Mr. Bobby Dennis to offer a few words on behalf of the museum. And then we're going to close out by having uh, Ms. Ware and Mayor Grinnell uh, have the last word. Uh, Mr. Bobby. Thank you, Mayor. And I would like to thank you for putting on this program. Because, <clears throat> number one, it hit home with what? We tried to get all of our guests to see of Natchez. Natchez wouldn't be Natchez without its people. The story of Natchez cannot just be told, but it should be recognized through the work of the people themselves. And Mr. Grinnell, the one, I've been knowing that family all my life. It lets me know that the work that our parents, our grandparents showed us, led us to, has led us into being servants of this city and devoted servants of this city. It is important that I recognize people like Ms. Nutter. I also worked for Ms. Nutter a long time ago. I knew Mr. Jim a long time. <laughs> having an opportunity. But this all comes from our experience and learning each other. The story of Natchez is told by its people. And thank you for bringing that to the forefront because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to start with all my guests, letting them know it's not just my story, it's the people of Natchez's story. And thank you so much. And thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Bobby. Well, Ms. Ware, Mayor Grinnell, and Mayor Grinnell, that is a beautiful, beautiful little girl you got there. Uh, thank you. <laughs> she, she wants all of the attention in here. Uh, <laughs> Um, Mayor, uh, I just want to, again, thank you uh, for this evening, uh, for having this Black History Moment in the city of Natchez. 
Uh, it is so important that we continue to tell this history, to share this history. Luana, you know, one thing that I forgot to mention about dad is that when uh, Warless Jackson was bombed uh, in Natchez, Warless Jackson was serving as a treasurer of the NAACP in Natchez. Uh, and after he was assassinated uh, in Natchez, uh, my dad, uh, well, our dad, uh, you know, took up the position of being treasurer uh, of the NAACP. He uh, replaced uh, Warless after uh, Warless had been assassinated. And there's a wonderful um, archive of pictures at the uh, historic Natchez building of um, the funeral of Warless Jackson. Um, and I forget the website of the photographer who took those pictures, uh, you can actually visit. If I think of it, I'll, I'll send it to you, Mayor, where you can send it out. Uh, but it, 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 it shows Roy Wilkins, who was the national president of NAACP in the pulpit at Zion Chapel Amy Church. Um, there are so many facets. We could be here all night talking about uh, the Black American history uh, and experience in Natchez. Uh, it's something that needs to be archived. It needs to be a part of the museum. Those stories need to be told. Uh, to be that history needs to be passed on to the next generation. Uh, again, I thank all of you, and I thank everyone who played a role in, uh, to our mom, Renzo Grinnell, who uh, was, of course, uh, a great part of, of telling us that history and being a part of that history. Um, yeah. Of course, she wanted to be in that march in 1965, but my dad said, no, you're pregnant, you're gonna stay at home and I'm gonna march. Thank Darren, you. Darren would have made history being a, a prison baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But a little known black history fact, and then I'm going into song, uh, Mayor. Uh, our dad was also the first black mill at Johns Manville. Uh, uh, Luana, you're going to end this with a song, I hope. Uh, but I got to say this you know, the mayor and Mel and I were born the same year. Mm -hmm. huh. Wow. Than you. All right. Um, Luana, you got the last one. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this was the ending song for the civil rights movement of every meeting that they had. And when we had our um, boycott in Natchez in the late 80s, this was also the ending song for all of the meetings during that era. And it goes a little something like this. I ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. I ain't gonna let nobody Turn me around, I'm going to keep on a walking, keep on a talking, going to freedom land. They ain't going to let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. I'm going to keep on a walking, keep on talking. Going to freedom road. Thank you. Oh. Mayor um, Grinnell and um, Lady Grinnell, could you answer a question for me? What are you saying to the young people of today to pique their interest in history of their generations? I tell you uh, right now with my students, I always tell them the history. I tell them the history of Alcorn. I tell them the history of Natchez and I tell them the history of our forefathers and talking about um, being 
eighth generation Natchezians. I've, I've been doing my ancestry DNA and it's just amazing of how, now I know how I'm related to people and you know, blacks and whites and Daryl can attest to even telling our white relatives how we are related. And you know, that everything has to come to a table at some point, you know, because it history repeats itself. And we don't want it to repeat itself in the negative way. We want it to be repeated positively. You make you you make changes from the mistakes that were made in history. So we have to continue to have that talk with not only our kids, your kids, everybody kids, so that they can know where they come from. You know, I have a son in Washington, D.C. and a daughter down in Zachary, Louisiana. And it's sad that we have no economic development in this area, as uh, Robert said. I wish we could, you know, um, not just deal with tourism, but have some sort of other economic development so we can keep our kids here or not just necessarily here within the 90 mile radius. You know, that's that's my plight. I, I would love to see that. I have my son, he's on Zoom, he's, he's listening, but he knows our history. So if we can have, if, if we could just have one class a week or maybe even one class a month with our students in Natchez, just to tell them the history of Natchez and not just from um, slavery, from the, from the uh, Native Americans, because they had it just as bad. We took their land from them. If we can tell that history, those are mistakes. Maybe the fighting will stop. Maybe the shooting will stop. Maybe the murders will stop because our forefathers fought for us to be where we are today. There. One of the major conduits to our young people on a daily basis are the teachers. And we've got to help teachers that inspire. So we've got to make sure that we motivate our teachers to inspire our young people. You know, it's, it's like me today. Here I am uh, teaching again. Um, on a daily basis. And today I, I, I told my students about a black history moment, you know, back when I was mayor to tell them about the proud to take a stand monument. And let me tell you, you could hear a pin drop in my classroom. The students were all attentive. They wanted to hear that story and they were just shocked to hear that over 400 people were arrested for marching, you know? So it's about inspiring and, and, and not just, you know, telling the black American experience, but to inspire them based on the discipline that you teach. You know, mm -hmm. I teach my chemistry students, when I teach my honor to biology mm -hmm. students, I want them to be able to compete with the best of them anywhere that they travel in life. So I try to inspire my students every single day. And I just not did that as an educator today. I did it for, for 30 years as a professor at Alcorn State University to inspire. So I think, you know, the one of our big conduits are our teachers. Mm -hmm. Our teachers being able to inspire and to motivate and to capture our right. young I think that's one of the major ways, and there are many other ways of doing it, but we've got to make sure that we we look out for all of our kids and never look down on any of them. You because know? you don't know where they come from. You don't know their environment. But not only that, but, you know, there have been individuals who said, you're not going to be anything. That's right. You're not going to do this. And those individuals have proven a lot of people wrong in life. You know, I remember this story uh, that a gentleman told me in Natchez, you know, that uh, his, his next door neighbor came out of his house to see this young man who was visiting this guy. And this young man who was visiting, he had gone on to become a medical doctor. And the gentleman next door was like, who is this guy? Who is he? And the young man said to that gentleman, he said, you don't remember me? 
He said, when I was a little boy, you told me that I was never going to be anything in my life. And here I am. I'm a medical doctor today. So, you know, never look down on uh, our young people. Lift them up. Motivate them. You know, Gwendolyn Brooks, when she moved to Chicago to set up her family, she decided to take a stroll in her neighborhood. And she stumbled across a pool called the Golden Shovel. And when she looked off into that pool hall, she saw seven young men shooting pool that should have been in school. And it inspired her to write the poem, We Real Cool, the pool players. There were seven at the Golden Shovel. We real cool, we left school, we lurk late. We strike straight, we sing sin, we thin gin, we jazz June, we die soon. We have a mission. We've got to save those seven young men. We've got to motivate. We've got to inspire. And you know, we we had great teachers when we were growing up. We had the Thelma Newsoms, we had the Sagos, we had the Terrells, we had the Jones, we had the Johnsons, we had the Grinnells, and, and, and the names goes on and on and on. Those teachers are gone. And I wish we had teachers to continue to inspire like they inspired us. And I tell you, my favorite uh, that motivated me, and there were two, uh, the great Georgia Scott, who yes. motivated me to become a scientist, and Lillian Etney, who gave me a strong background in chemistry when I took physical science under her. Well, I thank you so much. Gosh, it's just been wonderful. Please give them a hand and give yourselves a hand for being here. And may God bless you. May God continue to bless Natchez. And, and y'all, I wasn't wrong. I do see Ms. Terrell back there. <laughs> And we're going to enjoy now some refreshments. And we have some things here that will now be a part of the permanent collection. Uh, and thank you. Mayor Grinnell, be blessed. Ms. Ware, <laughs> take care. And our best to Michael. Thank you. And we want to thank Nifa, Michael, Lee, Mr. Bobby, our team. Thank you for making tonight happen. Vidal, and that's it. <laughs>